Welcome to Tracing Your Family Roots. I'm Chuck Mason, and with me today I have as our guest Nell Hurley. Nell is the Corresponding Secretary of the Fairfax Genealogical Society. And we have two guests from Ireland today. Fenton Mullen, who is the Executive Director of the Ulster Historical Foundation, and Dr. Brian Trainer, who is the Emeritus Research Director of the Foundation. Welcome. Thank you. First, I would like to start off by asking, what is the Ulster Historical Foundation? Tell us a little bit about it. Well, Chuck, the Ulster Historical Foundation is an educational nonprofit based in Belfast, Northern Ireland. And we were established in 1956. We opened for business in 1957. And we are the principal research organization in the northern part of the island of Ireland. <coughs> Excuse me. We've been tracing family history for people for over 55 years, and that was one of the original ideas behind the creation of this organization that we pr would and could provide a bridge between uh, Northern Ireland and the Ulster diaspora and help them reconnect with their Irish ancestors. So we've been undertaking research for, as I say, over 50 years. But we are many things. The foundation is not just a family history research organization. We are a publisher of historical books. We would be the leading publisher of history in Northern Ireland. Um, <coughs> we have a membership of some 2,000 around the world um, and all parts of the world. We also have been involved in a uh, a digitization project which has been island-wide to capture on database the, the vital records of baptisms, marriages and burials for Ireland. And we undertake events, uh, we, we host conferences and summer schools where people from overseas can come and learn from us, the experts, how to undertake their family history research using the original archives in Belfast or Dublin. And we host a number of outreach programs where we help with adult and education within the community in Northern Ireland. So we have a broad range of activities. But one of our principal activities is helping people to tap into their Irish roots. And so coming to America each year is an important part of that role. And you do that how often and, and where do you go? Well, we travel anywhere and everywhere for any group. Uh, we have no hang-ups about where we'll go to. We do it every year, usually in March. Um, and uh, I'm a mere cub at this game. <laughs> I've been doing it since 2001, but my colleague Brian has been doing this since the 1970s. Well, effectively, 1980 onwards. <laughs> you know, I was at the World Conference on Records in Salt Lake City, and after that, uh, you know, invitations came along. Uh, and. Uh, so I've been here virtually every year since 1980, and absolutely every year since 1989. Sometime twice a year <laughs> with these very energetic young people who now manage the operation. So we, we travel, as I say, we, we travel the length and breadth of the country on every tour. This particular occasion, we are doing 10 dates right across the, the country. So we started in Burbank. We did two days back to back in Phoenix. We were in Batesville, St. Joseph, Batesville, Arkansas, St. Joseph. Missouri, Kansas City, Missouri, uh, Indianapolis, Fairfax today, and then we go on to Greensburg, Pennsylvania, and Dunbar, West Virginia. And that would be a sort of indicative of the type of tour that we'd be under undertake. So we've traveled pretty much in almost all of the lower 48 states and uh, on many places, on you know, a lot of places on several occasions. And what, what does the foundation cover? What kind of records do you have for research? Well, we're, pre we're a research organization. We help people to access the records and how to extract as much value as possible from the records. We're not a repository as such, but it's interesting and, and also an important part of our uh, creation, our genesis, that we were established as the research division of the uh, Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, which would be the main archival institution in the northern uh, part of I Ireland. And Brian was the uh, archivist in charge of the record office for many years. Yes. Uh, I had really nothing to do with the family history research side of the operation when I became uh, the State Archivist of Northern Ireland in 1970. Uh, but uh, so I inherited the organization to run uh, as, a, as a business, as a sideline. And I found that uh, it was a very important part of the whole uh, work of the archives become, because something like 60 or 70 percent of the people who were using the records in the public record office as elsewhere in the British Isles, they were family history researchers. So I concentrated my efforts on uh, mastering the Ulster Historical Foundation, extending it a bit uh, 
and uh, stretching out beyond and then we just started doing these tours uh, and uh, so we, we, we do them for an educational purpose uh, and uh, that's the vital thing, you know, to encourage people in the Irish diaspora to appreciate that uh, everything is not impossible in Ireland. There's a general assumption that all the records have been destroyed. Those self-destructive Irish uh, <laughs> can look after nothing. Uh, and in fact, you know, uh, unique types of records are available in Ireland. And uh, uh, the archivists have been busy for the last hundred years or so, uh, making them accessible. Mm -hmm. So it's a positive message. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that, that you were digitizing the records. Mm -hmm. so are they going to be available on your website or a website yes. somebody could I mean, research? As well, I mean, our principal expertise is, is knowing how, where the records are at and how to get the information out of them. And we have published a range of resources to help researchers understand how to maximize the use of these, uh, these records going back through the different centuries. But yes, we are involved in digitization of records at different levels. Uh, I suppose the most important from the point of view of viewers would be the um, nationwide or island-wide project uh, under the aus auspices of the Irish Family History Foundation, which the aim there is to digitize all the vital records of baptisms, marriages, and burials. Now, there's a website already available called Roots Ireland, rootsireland.ie, with s over 20 million records. Uh, for some 28 of the 32 counties. Uh, and that would be one of the principal resources that people can use for the research. That is a culmination of uh, uh, digitization that began actually in the late 80s, early 1990s. And the project has been ongoing. So practically all of the Catholic records for those counties have been digitized up until 1900 and are available on this website. Uh, and, excuse me, and we are working on other records, including those records of the Protestant denominations. But we also are continuing to digitize the records because we're now in the 21st century and people are starting their research maybe in 1950 or 1940. Sure. So they need 20th century uh, material. So we are now digitizing, uh, in our case, uh, the also historical foundation's case, we're digitizing records up to 1930 for the Diocese of Down and Connor and Tremor. And we hope that will also continue island-wide. So there's a huge amount of digitization going on, not just by organizations like ourselves. Um, we are specifically involved in the, the church records, uh, as are the other centers in Ireland. But of course, the, the National Archives in Dublin have been digitizing records. The Public Record Office in Northern Ireland have been digitizing records. So in terms of digital records, the story is very good, a very positive one. And a lot has changed in Ireland within the last two to three years in that respect. Now, you've got these available, my question is, are they free or is there a fee involved? Well, some are free and some are, uh, some are uh, for a fee. Um, it depends the, the nature of the collection. Um, so the archives have made, for example, the 1901-1911 census free. Um, the birth, deaths and marriages or baptism and marriages, burials, they are via a uh, pay-per-view system, so uh, users buy credits and then they access the Excellent. records that way. But there's, uh, and of course, there are other services that offer, you know, um, that are sort of subscriptions. So there is payment. Wall, there is a payment wall there that people have to go. But when one thinks of the incredible access mm -hmm. that people are given right. to material for relatively small amounts of money, I mean, it doesn't compare to the situation mm -hmm. which, you know, 20 years ago you had to hop on a plane <laughs> and come to Ireland. <laughs> And we still want people to do that. I mean, one of the principal points of coming to America to do these tours is not just to educate, but actively encourage people to come to Ireland to research the, their ancestors for themselves and visit the place where their ancestors came from. We think that's vitally important um, and for people to get an understanding of the history of the island of Ireland. You, you've mentioned vital records. And what else do you, do you have available either at the foundation uh, if someone were to come there to mm -hmm. research, or what else might you be putting up or planning to put up in the future? Well, if we deal with first with the Ulster Historical Foundation, we, uh, as part of this national uh, island-wide project, we digitize and have available records relating to the counties of Antrim and Down, the two northeastern counties of the island. And that's in respect of church records, uh, some uh, civil records of marriage and ba uh, birth records. But the foundation has digitized a range of resources that uh, many of are available for our members. Uh, people can belong to our organization. These include, for example, a lot of census substitutes because of the loss of records, as Brian referred to. 
we would refer in Ireland to these census substitutes that people can use instead. So there might be records for the, the 19th century, the 18th century, and even the 17th century. So, for example, we the foundation has an index to wills in Ireland. Um, we have, for example, sources like the 1796 flax growers, a, list, a listing of farmers who were awarded a handloom or a spinning wheel mm -hmm. uh, as part of a government-sponsored scheme right back then. Uh, and we would have uh, gravestone inscriptions, a very large database of gravestone inscriptions for many graveyards across the six counties of, of Northern Ireland. So that's just indicative of the support the foundation has. We have this national project as I referred to for the vital records. The 1901 and 1911 census returns are available online at the National Archives in Dublin. And they have just recently released the tithe allotment books for the Irish Republic, which is a source from the early part of the 19th century. The Public Record Office of Northern Ireland have a range of resources. For example, they have the uh, 1912 Ulster Covenant. They have freeholders indexes, which is lists of those entitled to vote in county elections, which are very good for people looking ancestors in the early 19th and, and 18th century. Um, and they have just announced, just hot off the press, uh, launched later this week will be the valuation revision books for Northern Ireland for, uh, for you know, these are the annual revisions to the, the Griffith valuation and they will be uh, launched later this week by the Public Record Office in Northern Ireland. And what is the Griffiths valuation? <laughs> <laughs> well it's a census substitute, uh, primary. it's a land valuation um, uh, it was c compiled in Ireland in the period about 1847-48 through to about 1864. So it's quite uh, very valuable from the point of view that it was taken at either the height of the Great Famine or immediately after the Great Famine when so many people's ancestors left for America. Um, it is a valuation of almost every bit of land in Ireland, irrespective of whether your ancestors were poor and were rented a little potato patch to somebody owning a substantial or releasing a substantial farm. And it enables people to tap into um, Irish research in the middle of the 19th century. It's a great starting and jumping off point. Um, it's a land valuation record, it's not a census, but it does list individuals right down at the townland level, this townland which is the smallest administrative unit we have. So it's a quite powerful resource because there's so many parts to it. There's the printed valuation, there are the maps that accompany those that actually show the farm holdings. You can see your individual ancestors' farm holding on these maps. Um, and the revisions showing the changes in who was holding the land right down in some cases to the 1930s. Uh, so it's a, an incredible resource and large parts of it now are available online. So uh, researchers here in America can access that you know, from the comfort, or the comfort of their own home <laughs> at the present time. You mentioned two specific censuses. Were there others taken and lost like we have here in the United States? Yes, or? unfortunately there, there was records lost and uh, the, the early census returns were destroyed. Yes, uh, that, 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 that was one of the major uh, losses uh, when the old Public Record Office of Ireland in Dublin was destroyed in 1922. And incidentally, that wasn't uh, self-destruction by the Irish. Um, <laughs> uh, there was the elected uh, government of the Irish Free State. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, some of the uh, people who were in the uh, Irish Republican Army refused to accept the treaty that had been negotiated. Uh, uh, between Britain and uh, Ireland, uh, which partitioned the country, and they seized the uh, the four courts in the centre of Dublin, uh, and uh, that complex included the public record office of Northern Ireland. Well, uh, the elected government uh, uh, ignored this problem, uh, just allowed them to sit there, uh, and would have uh, as were starved them out. But an ultimatum came from the British government in the person of Winston Churchill, Secretary of State for the Colonies, uh, saying, unless you recover your four courts, the treaty that we have negotiated is dead. Uh, so the Irish Free State Army had to shell the four courts, and unfortunately they scored a direct hit on the public record office, which was being used by these dissidents as an armory. Uh, so the public record of the, the public records of Ireland were destroyed, and they included uh, exceptionally early census records. There were census records in Ireland uh, far earlier than virtually any other country in in Europe, uh, apart from Norway. There, there was a census of 1821 and, and a census of 1831. General censuses for the British Isles only started in 1841. 
and some of those 1821 census records actually survive for counties Cavan and Meath in particular for half the parishes they survive so uh, it's not despair and destruction <laughs> in total so to speak uh, a lot exists if only you make the effort to find it now that's that's the thing here I mean, in the United States we've had record losses but yeah. Yeah. oftentimes you can find other things <laughs> that may not totally give you all the mm -hmm. answers, but there is at least some substitutes there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also understand that you also were involved in publication projects mm -hmm. or publishing things. Could yeah. you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, well, certainly. The, the foundation, as I say, is the leading publisher of history in Northern Ireland. Um, we publish a very broad range of materials, so we're not only an academic publisher of you know, academic history. Uh, we publish a range of material. We, are, we started publishing over 40 years ago uh, with gravestone inscriptions, which, is a vital, which are a vital resource for family historians. And we have produced some 31 volumes, for, mostly for County Down, for Belfast, and, and parts of Antrim. Um, but we also quickly get into publishing historical works, first about the, both the Scots-Irish migration to America in the 18th century, with a classic title by R.J. Dixon called Ulster Immigration to Colonial America. Um, also publishing on the theme of Scottish migration to Ulster um, a, in the 17th century. But we have broadened out very significantly, and have, you know, our works include things like a six-volume history of the Irish parliaments from 1692 to 1800 to a history of the GAA, which we published with the Ulster Council of the GAA and the Ophi Library in Armagh a, a number of years ago. We published biographies of notable Ulster people. And our historical output in terms of publishing is about eight to ten titles a year. We would have a backlist of over 200 titles. What we're interested in, because the Ulster Historical Foundation, we're not the Ulster, histor or Ulster his uh, Family History Society, we're the Ulster Historical Foundation, and putting history in context is important to us. Um, uh, we want to tell the story of the people of Ulster. That's really our brief, and it's, it's a good brief because it's very broad, because we can <laughs> go any way and every way, and we try to do that with our publishing to show people that Ulster is a very rich and complex place. It's not black and white. We, you know, we have suffered from a negative image, and historically, Ulster has been a place with a very d distinct and uh, extraordinarily interesting character, and we want to try and represent that through our publishing. If and I could, you know from the... Uh, on my mother's side, I'm Scots-Irish, but like a, a lot of people in America, it's mixed marriage. On my father's side, it's uh, the Irish mm -hmm. Catholic potato farmer famine, mm -hmm. uh, as you were talking about. So for, for the millions of us, literally millions of us who are descendants of the, mm -hmm. the Irish potato famine emigres, where would we start? Since they tended not to be rich, they tended not to have land. Uh, would they be in the Griffiths evaluation if they were tenant farmers? If all we know is a, a, the, the last name or possibly a county, where would we start doing our research? Well, the simple answer uh, to the, the, that if they were still in Ireland at the time of the Griffith evaluation, then they almost certainly will show in the Griffith evaluation. It doesn't matter how poor your ancestors were, they generally will be recorded. recorded. Um, in ter it is a very difficult problem, and I know most people who are, or a lot of people who are researching ancestors have this born Ireland and don't know where to start. But one of the things we would tell uh, researchers here in America is you need to exhaust all the possibilities here in America. You need to do your homework in America. And I think for us, we, our experience over the years in, in, in undertaking research for clients has been that in a number of cases, quite a number of cases, people seem to think they can just short circuit the system and think somehow Ar people <laughs> in Ireland will resolve this problem that I haven't been able to. And I don't think they make maybe sometimes enough use of the resources in America. And one thing we would point, one, one particular source we would point people to are gravestone inscriptions, tombstone inscriptions, recordings on stone here, because the Irish are very good in what they record of themselves. They're very descriptive. You'll, people, when they visit Ireland, will see that in, in our old cemeteries, how descriptive some of the headstones can be. And the Irish have a marvelous tendency in many instances here in America through even the 18th century, but certainly the 19th and early 20th century, of telling their story on stone and recording crucially that piece of information where they came from in Ireland. And that can be the vital clue. So that's one specific source we would refer people here to in America is to make better use of the gravestone inscriptions that might survive in the eastern states and the Midwest. Um, but of course, with the digitization of things like the Griffith valuation and the tithe books, one can use those to identify, well, where is my surname? 
concentrated. Where does this surname show up in the Irish records of the middle 19th century? And that is at least a starting point for people. So we would re recommend that they use the index to indexes to Tithe and Griffith in that way. Yes, and wills are an, or, an important source that family historians have not yet started using. Some academic researchers uh, like uh, Richard McMaster, whose book on Irish immigration in the 18th century, the Ulster Historical Foundation has published, uh, has found uh, in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, you know, a will of uh, an individual who went over back and forth from uh, the Susque Susquehanna Valley oh, yeah. every year to bring back indentured servants and linen. Um, Every year he did this, and when he was coming back in 1735, uh, he died on the voyage, and there was a, a, an inventory of his assets, and he was bringing indented, indentured servants. Um, and uh, you see, Lancaster County have wills back to 1720. Philadelphia has wills for Pennsylvania back to 1700. Uh, Abbeville in South Carolina mm -hmm. have uh, records back to about 1760. And uh, these are public records. Uh, and they are accessible if you make the effort. And particularly if you get wills of women, uh, they provide lots of relationships. So uh, wills are an important source, and I stress that. Uh, that's one thing you can do mm -hmm. apart from going out and recording gravestone inscriptions. Mm -hmm. And if someone decides they want to come to Ireland and come to the foundation and do research, what would you suggest that they prepare ahead of time, come with? Do they need to make an appointment? <laughs> yes. Well, well, uh, well we, 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 are a pu we have a public office. We're open 9, uh, nine to 5.30. Um, so people can always come, but it's, it's, it's sent, uh, come and show up on spec. But they're, they're welcome, or they're advised maybe to make an appointment if they want to speak to with one of our research staff. It depends what you want to achieve. I mean, this year is a great year to come to Ireland. We have the gathering this year. And the length and breadth of the country, there will be events across the island uh, that people can tap into, you know, music and entertainment. But in terms of research, it, it, do you want someone to solve the problem for you, present you with a report, and then give you an itinerary to follow to take you to the grave of the ancestor mm -hmm. or the church they were baptized or the homestead? So that's uh, and that, those are the three things obviously that most people want. Or do you want to do the, the re do you research want to do the research yourself? yourself? So we can help you depending on. If you're if you want somebody to present you with a completed report, obviously you would need to give at least nine to twelve months to give the researcher whoever you would use, be it the Ulster Historical Foundation or another, that you give them time to do an adequate survey and, and produce the best report that they can. But uh, shorter period period than that, if you're making a trip to Ireland and want to factor into research, we can certainly give uh, advice and orientation on how to maximize your time in the, the record of us. And that would be a major strength of the foundation from the point of view of visitors coming to Ireland is we can give them clear ad advice on how to use their time in the record office uh, the most profitable in the most profitable way, uh, as well as making suggestions for them for itineraries because if they have a vague idea that the ancestors came from, say, you know, parts of South Derry or you know, Fermanagh, not only what they might do in relation to their family directly, but what other historical sites of interest they might take in while they're there. So we can offer a range uh, of services there, uh, and you know the idea being to enable them to have the, the, the most valuable trip. Um, but if they're planning research in Ireland, they do need to do their homework before they leave. Yeah. We've got just a couple of minutes left. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you feel we should tell our viewers about? Well, I mean, I would, I would just reiterate again, this is a, this is a very good news story in, in Ireland at the present time. There are so much has been digitized in the last number of years. Um, just recently, I mean, I mentioned the, 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 the valuation revision books for Northern Ireland, which are coming online, being launched on the 27th of March in a few days' time. Just a, an example of quite unusual sources that have uh, just also become available, the Morpeth Roll, a roll of uh, a 420 meter parchment signed by about 160,000 Irish people uh, presented to Lord Morpeth when he was leaving Ireland after having served as Chief Secretary. And this wasn't a protest mm -hmm. document, this is a more of a, a congratulatory, you know, uh, thank you. Um, now, not all those names that have signed that have a, a specific location, they haven't necessarily given the address, but in s some instances they have given a specific place 
This dates from 1841, so there's an example of another census substitute for four years before the Great Famine. And that just recently, I mean, within the last few weeks, has become available. Um, so the, 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 the situation is improving all the time in terms of access to digital data. But what I suppose what we would say to researchers is not everything is on Ancestry or Find My Past. <laughs> a lot of it is still offline, and you still need to come to Ireland to do your research either in Belfast or Dublin. One, one question I thought of, we've got, or you've mentioned all these records, but what kind of indexes might there be to them? How do people actually find their ancestors? The index to the digital records to, or to, to any of the paper. records. Well, I mean, uh, to take the public record office in Northern Ireland and Pastor Brown because their finding aids are superb. Oh yes, uh, uh, that was a major asset. Uh, uh, they had two hundred foot run of typescript calendars around uh, the reference room uh, in the old public record office. You know, those were transcripts of documents of emigrant letters. They're about. Uh, four or five thousand emigrant letters from America. Unfortunately, very few of them from women, um, sadly. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, they exist. And, uh, well, uh, there are also gravestone inscriptions uh, where pe emigrants uh, paid for the erection of gravestones yes. back in Ireland. And, uh, well, they obviously are a vital link. Um, and, uh, uh, well, what uh, I would say is, uh, Anyone who sees this program, if they're a member of a society uh, and they think that uh, their uh, community would be interested in learning a bit about researching in Ireland, that they should make direct contact with Finton uh, to organize an event on a future tour. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're just about out of time. I want to thank you for being with us today and hope that the rest of your tour is successful. Mm -hmm. We just sit here and pretend we're talking <laughs> until they 